Happy Valentine's Day everyone, the Green Scorpion here, and today, love is in the air. I've been racking my brain on how to go about a Valentine's Day special since Valentine's Day has become less about love and romance and more as an excuse for commercialism and making fun of singles as of late. Then I found out that there are plenty of love stories in video games just waiting to be examined. Unfortunately, compelling and well-written love stories are few and far between in video games since love stories usually need a lot of exposition for both characters involved and the relationship between them. And that's tough to do in video games since gameplay is often the first priority. On the other hand, that only means that gamers become all the more surprised when a good love story is presented. And today, I'll be shedding some light on 10 love stories that manage just that. I'll be judging these love stories based on the characterization and development of the parties involved, the amount of time and exposition on the relationship between the characters, and whether it has a sense of closure in terms of the narrative, whether it's a happy ending, tragic ending, or somewhere in between. Also, since we're talking about love stories here, keep in mind that spoilers are everywhere on this list. And, as usual, only games I've played, and only one per franchise. So grab a box of chocolates and maybe have a seat with your mate, whoever he or she may be, and let's take a look at the top 10 greatest video game love stories. Right. Yeah, I mean, yeah, all the girls fall for it. Let me show you. What, what are you doing? It'll be fun. Oh no, 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 no! Been taking lessons on the side. As I played through Brutal Legend, I was genuinely surprised to see an interesting relationship between Eddie and Ophelia. These two meet up almost right at the start of the game, and the way they meet up can only be described as incredibly humorous. Oh man, don't tell me I've been slaying hot girls this whole time. What I like about this love story is how normal it feels. Eddie and Ophelia act like they're regular cells around each other as the game progresses, and the relationship between them feels like a classic college romance without getting awkward. There are also plenty of moments in the game where Eddie shows just how much he cares for Ophelia, from risking his neck at the claws of a heavy metal spider to going all Hercules and diving headfirst into the sea of black tears. What's also great is the fact that there is conflict. When Lars dies at the hands of Diviculus, Eddie finds it difficult to trust Ophelia when the possibility arises that she's a spy for Diviculus. He wants to trust her, but ultimately can't when Ophelia refuses to talk. You said you'd trust me. I did, and in return you kept secrets from me. And now Lars is dead. This shows that Eddie takes trust very seriously, and it also serves to give Ophelia some good development, because the reason she was keeping secrets was to protect Eddie. Unfortunately, she succumbs to her dark side when she gets scorned. Not only does this lead to a pretty awesome battle between these two characters later on, but it also makes their love for each other all the more sincere at the end of it all. Truth be told, the love story between Eddie and Ophelia is a bit cliché, but it carves enough of a niche for itself to land it at the start of this countdown. You're gonna pay for this later. Now here's one you probably would have never expected, but landing at the number 9 spot is Phoenix and Iris from Phoenix Wright Trials and Tribulations. Granted, the love story between these two isn't entirely on the forefront, but in good old courtroom fashion, allow me to state my case for this one. Anyone who has been following the Ace Attorney narrative will know that the main reason Phoenix became a lawyer is because Miles Edgeworth defended him in a class trial. But is that truly the only reason? Fast forward to Phoenix Wright's trial where Mia defends him in Trials and Tribulations. We see a mild-mannered, emotion-driven Phoenix Wright who was an art major at the time. He wasn't studying law. During this, he was dating Dahlia Hawthorne, who I addressed before as a demonic femme fatale who is only out for herself. Needless to say, the trial goes off the deep end and Dahlia turns on Phoenix and completely renounces him. It wasn't until after that trial when Phoenix started gaining a true passion for becoming a defense attorney. Now fast forward even further to the final trial of the game. We are introduced to Iris, who is apparently Dahlia's twin sister and is the defendant for the case. When Phoenix meets her, he obviously gets extremely worried, but his suspicions thankfully become refuted when we meet Dahlia once again who is being channeled into the mortal world due to being given a death sentence after her conviction. So what does this all have to do with the relationship between Phoenix and Iris? Well, ever since Phoenix was screwed over by Dahlia, he has never made any attempt to find love again. Despite following his mentor's creed to trust his client no matter what, he could never find it in himself to trust someone with his heart again. That is, until Iris reveals who she really was during Phoenix's school years. All of those happy memories Phoenix had with Dahlia, the laughs, the joy in their hearts, it was not with Dahlia, but with Iris. 
turns out that Dahlia coerced Iris into posing as her and being with Phoenix in her place. Though while it started as a hoax, Iris grew to care for Phoenix and even love him. This is an example of a love story that never was, but also may yet to be. Iris shows that she still truly cares for Phoenix as a person, and, in return, Phoenix is overjoyed to find out that even if she wasn't who he thought she was, all of those memories and moments he shared with Iris were the real deal. The only thing keeping this story at number 9 is because it was never truly resolved and Iris had not appeared in another game since Trials and Tribulations. That being said, with Iris no longer being tormented by her sister and Phoenix's confidence to trust his heart to someone restored, who knows? Maybe they can get a second chance. Promises, promises. If there was ever a true sign that two people loved each other, it's the mutual willingness to be with each other through thick and thin, and Big Boss and Eva take this to a pretty enormous extreme. When Big Boss was only known as Naked Snake, he and Eva meet up with the mutual objective to put an end to the Shagahod Crisis. Throughout the game, Eva will provide Snake with intel from behind enemy lines, and the two become quite the team. What's great about the relationship between Big Boss and Eva is that Metal Gear Solid 3 provides and dedicates plenty of time to develop these two characters. As the game progresses, their relationship slowly grows deeper, stronger, and even comical at points. Are you on a diet? What did you say? Calorie made is supposed to be really good for losing weight. <laughs> Are you saying I'm fat? No. What clenches it though is the ending of Metal Gear Solid 3 and what transpires from there. Even though Eva disappears after she and Naked Snake share a nice love scene, Naked Snake still seeks Eva out after he becomes the new big boss. Despite the aftermath of the Cold War and despite the war economy growing out of control, they still seek to be with each other. This becomes evident when Solid Snake talks with Eva in Metal Gear Solid 4. It's revealed that Big Boss sought to have Eva be a part of the Les Enfants Terribles project in order to give birth to Solid Snake. However, has anyone ever thought why? Well, here's my theory. Naked Snake's clones could have been created using anyone. But there was only one person Big Boss trusted with his flesh and blood, and that was Eva. She was the one person that was willing to throw herself in the fire for him, and he knew that. And the result of this love story manifested as one of the greatest characters and heroes in gaming, Solid Snake. Admittedly, this love story doesn't have too much in the forefront, but when you look at it from behind the scenes, there is plenty to be said about the relationship between these two steadfast government agents. You know, in terms of the Mass Effect series, I had half a mind to include every single relationship involving Shepard on this list. Granted that I only played the game twice and I only managed to romance Thane and Morinth, but each one of those romances are just so well written and so well developed that I had a hard time choosing one in the first place. However, after some further research, I was reminded of a simple yet deceivingly deep relationship between Ereba and Char. For a quick background, Shepard meets Ereba in Mass Effect 2. She's an Asari merchant on Ilium who is dating a Krogan named Char at the time. Ereba is worried that all Char wants out of her is the chance to reproduce and in order to convince her that her love is genuine, he continuously jabbers some... less than spectacular poetry. So when Shepard talks to Ereba, it's pretty safe to say that she has her doubts. Look at him, he's obviously crazy about you. Is he? I mean, what if he just wants to have kids? Am I just his baby-making machine? He said I wasn't, but... If he said that, then you either trust him so you have nothing to worry about, or you don't, and you've already decided. I honestly love this conversation. Despite this being a video game, Ereba's concerns are actually very realistic. In addition, it's just so adorable to hear Char in the background using poetry to try to convince her that his love for her is true. Shepard can either convince Ereba to stay with Char or to forget about him. If the former is done, you will meet Ereba again in Mass Effect 3 where she mentions that she is now happily married to Char. At this time, Char is off fighting a war against the Reapers and Shepard receives a mission to search for a missing Krogan team. When Shepard's squad reaches the site, they find that the Krogan party has been wiped out. And Char was among them. They find a message that is to be delivered to Ereba and... <sighs> okay, honestly guys, I, I can't do this justice. Um, spoiler alert, J just listen. Excuse me. I'm sorry. You need to hear this. Oh, Blue Rose of Ilium. 
If these humble words reach you, then I have joined my ancestors. No. No, no, no. My dream was to be by your side, a weed beside your beauty, twining together in the warm Tachanka sun. Oh, Char. But if my last days must be with Krant instead of kindness, still I will remember the perfume of your scent and the soft touch of your petals. Let my broken bones build a wall around your garden, so you and the flower we planted together can grow safe and strong. Thank you. Uh, I should... Whenever love stories are mentioned in terms of the Legend of Zelda series, Link and Zelda are often the first two you think of. While I can see why many gamers would come to that conclusion, what many don't realize is that there have only been three games in the entire series that actually establish a relationship between these two. However, not even the love story in Skyward Sword holds a candle to Café and Anju from Majora's Mask. The Couple's Mask side quest involving Café and Anju is arguably the largest side quest in the whole game. When Link talks to the mayor's wife in Clocktown, it comes to light that Café has been missing for some time. Link uses the Café mask to try to find information about him, and you eventually come to Anju, the town's innkeeper. You find out that Anju and Café were to be married soon, but Anju becomes worried since Café has been missing. After further investigation, Link eventually meets up with Café, and his fate is a cruel one. You find out that Café has been cursed by the Skull Kid to be stuck in a child's body, and, on top of that, he lost the ceremonial mask that he was going to use at his wedding with Anju. Just wrap your heads around this one, guys. That's the equivalent of losing your wedding ring! Once you rally the information to Anju that Café has been found, you travel to Ikana Canyon with Café to retrieve the mask in a sort of mini-dungeon. This is where things start to get heart-wrenching. By the time you help Café retrieve the mask, it is now the third day and Termina is on the verge of being destroyed by the moon. Everyone in the town has fled to safety, except for a select few. Including Anju. Once you tell Anju that Café will return, Anju waits at the inn, sitting in a room next to her wedding dress as she awaits the man she loves. Once he arrives, it might as well be the most touching and awe-inspiring scene in the Legend of Zelda series. Despite the hardships, despite Café's situation, he and Anju unite in an act of true love and become a couple. Then they decide to stay there and greet the morning together. Their lives are complete. They have found happiness in each other, so they decide to die together in each other's arms, knowing that they have found true love. It's one thing to be willing to live with the one you love, and it's a whole another level when you're willing to die with them. Much like Mass Effect, I had quite a bit to choose from in terms of the Assassin's Creed games. Unlike the Mass Effect series, picking which one was surprisingly easy. This next one comes from Assassin's Creed 2, and while Rosa was a strong female character and Sophia had a ton of development, I just can't overlook Ezio's relationship with Christina Vespucci. This love story begins during Ezio's younger days when he tries to flirt with Christina for the first time. With very little success. However, he gets a second chance when Vietti de Pazzi assaults Christina and he comes to the rescue. By the way, pay attention to that phrase, second chance, because this love story resides in that notion. As the story continues, we see young Ezio continue his relationship with Christina and the two seem to truly love each other, much to the chagrin of Mr. Vespucci. Unfortunately, this changes when Ezio's life takes a turn for the worst. Ezio's family is executed and he takes it upon himself to retrieve their bodies and give them a proper burial with the help of Christina. This is where we get some great moments with Ezio and Christina struggling to keep the relationship while still adhering to what they have to do. Unfortunately, fate has chosen different paths for these two and Ezio is forced to leave Christina behind. We then fast forward to Ezio's return to Florence and the first person he visits is Christina. Sadly, Ezio is not treated to a pleasant welcome when he hears that Christina, under the insistence of her father, was to be married to Manfredo Sorrini. What transpires is one of my favorite moments in all of Assassin's Creed. Let's 
Beta, what are you doing? Do you love her? What? Do you love her? Christina! The woman you're about to marry! Yes, I do. I, I swear I do. Kill me here, and I will die still loving her. You are never going to gamble again. Never, Marcelli. You will be a good husband to her. Or I will hunt you down. Kill you myself. This moment further solidified my love for Ezio as a character. He loved Christina with all his heart, and yet he does the right thing and knows his place. However, what Ezio was unaware of is that Christina still loves him, so he missed his second chance after he confronted Manfredo. We then fast forward once again, this time eight years. Christina is now married to Manfredo, but Ezio decides to surprise Christina in the only way he knows how. It doesn't go well. It's amazing just how much these two love each other, and yet they keep missing their chances to be together. This all comes full circle in 1494, where Christina meets her end. Ezio attempts to rescue her from a band of Savonarola fanatics, but he realizes that it's too late. I wish we could have had a second chance. This moment is the reason I chose this love story from the Assassin's Creed series. Ezio and Christina, ever since their first meeting, have loved each other like no other. Unfortunately, Destiny had other plans. It's one of those love stories that never truly happened, yet the passion and care that these two characters share still shines through in the good times as well as the bad. Phoenix Wright and Iris may have a second chance in the years to come, but for these two, it was never meant to be. Super Paper Mario got mixed reception when it was released. It branched away from the usual Paper Mario formula to bring us something different and, while it was a really clever concept, not everyone welcomed the change in gameplay. However, if there was anything that Super Paper Mario brought forth that deserves nothing but praise, it's the love story between Blumiere and Timpani. Two of the main characters in this game are the notorious villain, Count Bleck, and Mario's helpful guide, a pixel named Tippy. After Count Bleck uses Peach and Bowser to summon the Chaos Heart with the intent to destroy all worlds, Tippy enlists the help of Mario to find the Pure Hearts and put a stop to him. As the game progresses, we are treated to dialogue pertaining to a certain memory between two characters called Blumiere and Timpani. It is revealed that Lady Timpani was a human member of the Tribe of Ancients who saved the life of Lord Blumiere, a member of the Tribe of Darkness. The memory shows these two characters fall in love despite their kin and visited each other in secret quite often. Unfortunately, Blumier's father finds out about their relationship and curses Timpani to wander the dimensions until her inevitable death. What transpires are the events of Super Paper Mario. It's apparent that Tippy isn't completely there in terms of her memories and she doesn't exactly remember much of her past until near the end of the game. Those sections of dialogue we see throughout the game are actually her memories, and during the last flashback she realizes that Count Black is actually a distraught Lord Blumiere. Blumiere was devastated to the point of madness when Timpani was taken away from him. In response, he turns to the Dark Prognosticus to put an end to all worlds, because if he can't find true love, no one can. We actually notice this during certain conversations that Count Black has with his minions. He seems to recall some depressing memories, but he doesn't really talk about it. So you can imagine the conflict these characters have at the end of the game. Tippy realizes that the only way to stop the Chaos Heart from wiping out reality is to kill Count Black, and she is torn between eliminating the person she loves or letting the worlds be destroyed. But alas, Count Black proposes another way to save all worlds using the newly restored Pure Hearts. Count Black and Tippy, finally reunited, decide to do what they have always wanted. They return to the chapel in Castle Black, and a wedding takes place between these two characters. Channeling the true love they possess, they empower the Pure Hearts to banish the Chaos Heart in order to prevent the destruction of all worlds, at the cost of their own selves. As I said during the Cafe and Andrew segment, it's a whole nother level when you're willing to die with the one you love. Only this time, Blumier and Timpani possessed a love so powerful and profound that it was enough to save the universe and the influence they left behind after their own wedding was truly apparent among the other characters. No one truly knows what happened to these two after the game was over. But I think it's safe to say that, wherever they are, they couldn't be happier.
Alright guys, I know you've been waiting for it. We finally arrived to the best love story from Final Fantasy. Go on, take a guess on which one it is. Good? Okay, here it is. <laughs> yeah, I'm just kidding. Go on, take another guess. You got it? Alright then. Mm, not even close. Uh, okay, seriously guys, you should know me well enough to know by now that I love Final Fantasy VI and I think it's the best in the series. So, number three on this list is Celis and Locke. It's true that Final Fantasy VI didn't really focus on individual characters and instead focused on a whole group, but there's still so much to be seen about these two characters. Celis first meets Locke in the dungeon of South Figaro where Kefka imprisoned her. She refuses Locke's help at first, but she eventually warms up to him. What I like about this relationship is the contrast between these two characters. Celis is a Magitek knight who was also the general to the Gestalian army, while Locke is a lowly commoner who makes a living through treasure hunting. In addition, it seems that Locke is a lot more in control of his emotions than Celis is, considering how difficult it is for Celis to get along with the Returners. As the adventure continues, we see the relationship between these two develop with good moments as well as difficult. There's even a point where Locke starts to question Celis' loyalty. That only makes this relationship stronger because, think about it, what's a relationship without its doubts? Celis and Locke are plunged into a world of literal madness, especially when their adversary is the notorious Kefka Palazzo. The fact that these two characters have doubts about each other only makes this relationship more believable, because they'll still come through when it all comes down to it. Speaking of which, that's exactly what happens during the climax of this game. Once Kefka completely decimates the world, Celis wakes up from a year-long coma with no one around but Sid. Celis is finding it difficult to have no one around, and Sid is the only one she has left at this point. It's up to the player to see that Sid survives since he becomes ill at this point of the game. However, what happens if he doesn't make it? Celis reaches her breaking point. She has nothing left. Sid is gone. Her friends are nowhere to be found. Locke isn't there to give her the support and the love she so desperately needs. So, she does the unthinkable. And yet she survives. She washes up on a shore and she finds a wounded bird with a familiar bandana. This is the moment where Locke really comes through for her. The bandana belongs to Locke, and Celis takes it as a sign that he's still alive. During the second half of the game, Locke is nowhere to be found, but the party eventually gets a clue that points him to being in the Phoenix Cave. Anyone who has played Final Fantasy VI will know just how frustrating this place is. Regardless, the party steps through and finds Locke, and the reunion between Celis and Locke becomes very heartwarming. Most of what makes this love story so great is Celis' struggle combined with Locke's confidence. Locke becomes sort of an anchor to Celis as she struggles to settle with who she really is. It's a case where one supports the other and vice versa, and it truly shines with these two. Even among a world that has been completely destroyed, the love and sincerity between Celis and Locke acts as a small beacon of hope among this post-apocalyptic disaster. Mark it down, people. This will be the first time I talk about Prince of Persia. I will admit to not being a huge fan of this series, but I can't deny that it brings some pretty fantastic stuff to the table, including the love story between the Prince and Farah. Admittedly, my only experience playing the Prince of Persia series was with the Warrior Within. Regardless, I'll do my best here. The Prince and Farah first meet when the Prince releases the Sands of Time. Farah demands that the Prince returns the Dagger of Time to undo the damage he caused, but the Prince isn't so quick to trust her. It isn't until the prince defeats his father that the two start a somewhat reluctant camaraderie, and this is where their relationship starts to take root. Rather than blatantly begin to fall in love with each other, these two start making more of a great team rather than a great couple. Farah has seen more than her fair share of conflict and is quite handy with a bow, making her a great asset to the prince's quest. We don't really see a true love connection until they fall into the catacombs and stumble upon an underground hot spring, and the prince describes it as if he couldn't tell whether it was a dream or reality. At this moment, the prince finds that he truly loves Farah and displays it on several occasions. He holds onto the blade end of a dagger to try to save her life. He rejects power for the sake of reversing time and bringing her back from her death. 
Pay attention to that last part for a second. By causing the grand reversal, the prince turned back time to the point where Vizier betrays Farah, erasing his adventure and his relationship with Farah. This leads to the prince preemptively warning Farah of the Vizier's intentions and returning the Dagger of Time before the sands can be released again. Farah doesn't remember anything that happened during the initial adventure, but thanks to the prince possessing her pendant as well as her secret word, the relationship begins anew. The prince then proceeds to try to win Farah over again because he loves her that much, even after becoming a sand creature. Obviously, Farah becomes distrusting, but the prince does everything he can to show her that he cares, from saving her people to purging his dark side. This love story is so fantastic that it happened twice, both in completely different scenarios. Not only are these two a great couple, they're a great team, and at the end of it all, not even time is able to separate these two loving warriors. So, tell me, think a girl would fall for that? Before we move on to the number one love story in video games, I want to express my respect to those who wrote the love stories on this list, as well as some honorable mentions. Let's face it guys, love stories in video games are not easy to do. With video games mainly focusing on gameplay rather than story, it's tough to include enough depth and detail to make a relationship between two characters interesting and believable without it becoming cliche or generic. These previous nine love stories rose to the top because they had lovable characters and their relationships, at the very least, felt genuine and believable. Players are able to relate even if the characters involved make for some pretty bizarre couples. I had quite a lot of trouble ordering the love stories on this countdown. But number one was no contest. It was a love story like no other, to the point where the characters involved will give up anything, including their own lives, to show just how much they love each other. And this love story comes from my favorite game in the Professor Layton series. Ladies and gentlemen, Herschel and Claire from Professor Layton and the Unwound Future. Ten years prior to the game's events, Professor Layton shared a very cheerful relationship with Claire. Claire was a brilliant scientist who respected Layton, and she was also the assistant to Dimitri Allen, the game's villain, and Bill Hawks, one of my most hated characters in video game history. Through Professor Layton's memories, we see just how much Layton and Claire cared for each other. The interactions between the quiet and shy Herschel Layton and the enthusiastic Claire are both heartwarming and admittedly really cute. In fact, we see in one memory that Claire gives Layton his signature top hat, the very symbol of Layton's character. You could argue that Professor Layton owes a lot of who he is to Claire, seeing as Claire constantly refers to him as a gentleman. This makes things all the more heartbreaking given the events of the game. Claire has been working with Bill Hawks and Dimitri Allen on developing a time machine, and she was the first human subject to take it for a test run. Bill Hawks, after being offered a huge sum of money, enlists Claire's help to run this very test. Dimitri then finds a fatal error in his calculations and tries to stop Bill from running the test, but it becomes too late. The time machine explodes, destroying a nearby apartment building, severely wounding Bill Hawks, and bringing Claire's life to a tragic end. Needless to say, Professor Layton is distraught by this. Soon after, he tries to investigate why this had to happen, but every time he gets close to an answer, he is stopped in his tracks because SOMEONE doesn't want anyone to know what happened. By the time the events of the game occur, Layton has come to accept that Claire is gone and he will never see her again. So you can imagine his surprise when he sees her during the game. While investigating Bill Hawk's disappearance, Layton meets Claire, who takes the guise of Celeste, Claire's non-existent sister, in order to protect Layton from the truth for the time being. As more details of the events unfold, Layton finds out that Dimitri's true plan was to build a new time machine because there still might have been a possibility to save Claire's life. Even Don Paolo gets in on this plan because, as it turns out, Dimitri and Don Paolo actually had feelings for Claire as well. What's interesting here is that Dimitri and Don Paolo cling on to the hope that Claire could be saved. Layton, on the other hand, is the only person who accepts Claire's death because he is a man of logic and reason. He knows that there is no possible way for Claire to have survived that explosion, so he agrees to it to avoid further torment. For once though, Layton is wrong. The reason Claire exists during Layton's investigation is because the time machine that she tested with Bill Hawks actually sort of worked. She was plunged 10 years into the future, but due to that very fatal error that Dimitri discovered, she has a limited time before she is sent back to the time of the explosion. In other words, she's on borrowed time. However, during this borrowed time, we see Claire and Layton's relationship sort of rekindle itself. 
These two become quite the team during the events of the game, and you can see their relationship grow stronger and deeper. And Leighton isn't even aware that this is the woman he loves. So when he finally discovers the truth, we are treated to one of the saddest moments in video game history. During the game's epilogue, Claire's time is almost up. Very soon, she will be sent back to the time of the explosion and her life will come to an end. Claire knows this, and she does her best to ensure that her beloved Herschel will be able to stay strong without her. What follows is this. You can't go! I don't want to say goodbye again! I can't! I won't! This scene is just powerful. Throughout the entire game, Professor Layton has been a cool and collected character that based his judgment on logic and reasoning. This is the one moment where we actually see Layton completely lose it. He finally sees Claire again after all these years, only to see her go away to her death. He can't accept it now. He refutes his original acceptance of Claire's death. He rejects the fact that he cannot be with Claire. He is willing to give up logic and reason, the two things that define his very character, if it means he can be with Claire again. Not only does this bring them both to tears, this is a moment that brought me to tears as well. The love that these two share is apparent, and it's heartbreaking to see them say goodbye. This is a love story that is heartwarming and tragically sincere. Fate brought these two together only to rip them apart, and yet they managed to remain strong through it all. I am the Green Scorpion, and while I acknowledge that there are plenty of great love stories in video games, none can hold a candle to the love story of Herschel and Claire. The greatest love story in video game history. Happy Valentine's Day everyone, and I'll see you next time. Take care.